your 16. And you find 1 Samuel chapter number 16. You can go to Acts chapter number 13. Good to be in God's house this morning. Amen. Thank God fall is just around the corner. I like fall. Amen. I, I, I love it. I, boy, I'll tell you what. I hate to sit out on the back deck with a fire pit going when it's 95 degrees. Just something about that. Amen. Boy, I, now we can have a fire about just before sun goes down. And start a fire out on the back deck, and boy, I mean, just prop your feet up. We sit out there the other night and drink some hot chocolate. Hey, man, I like to drink a cup of coffee in the evenings. I'll fix a cup, but then I, I, hey, I, I told Barbara, I said, "You want some hot chocolate?" She said, "Yes." I said, "Well, I'm just going to fix me some too." Uh, so I fixed me some up too. We had a good time out there, hey, man. All right, uh, first, uh, uh, let's let's just go to the Book of Acts first. Keep your marker there at uh, chapter number 16, book 1 Samuel. We'll read a couple of verses here in, in the book of Acts. Uh, I want to kind of start a little mini-series on something been kind of stirring my heart for a while. I like to do that. I like to know where I'm going on Sunday morning as far as preaching. And if God changes my mind, then I'll change my mind for that Sunday morning and I'll preach but otherwise, people say, well, how do you know what to preach on Sunday morning? I, hey, I've got a whole Bible to preach. You can preach anywhere you want. It's good all over. It doesn't matter where you cut it. Just cut that thing open and just preach the Word of God out of it. Get first uh, uh, Acts chapter number 13. Uh, we're, we're talking about here where he began to send people out of the churches and, and this uh, laying their hands on them. Boy, they were finally getting obedient to what God told them to do. God told them, when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall be witnesses unto me. And he used the word both. He said, I want you to go here, I want you to go to there, and I want you to go out there, and I want you to do it all at the same time. They didn't do that. Well, now they're doing that, all right? They're having to do it from Antioch. Why? God scattered that church. So, no, son, let me tell you, if you don't want to get obedient to God, God will get you obedient. Amen. He knows how to do that. Now, I want to look at a couple of verses this morning very familiar to you. Verse number 22, he's talking about Saul, the son of Sis, in, in verse number 21. Who was he? He was a man of Benjamin. He served as king over all Israel for a period of 40 years. Boy, it's a long time. Uh, they wanted a king. God helped them. They made what's called the Ebenezer Stone. They named that, which means hither to the Lord hath helped us. And at that point in time, they said, hey, they came Samuel said, we want a king like everybody else. It's not what we're looking for. God helped us. We got the victory. That's not what we're looking for. God wanted a theocracy. But they didn't want that. You go into the Middle East today and what do you got? You got dictatorships, kings. Dictators. That's about the only thing that will work over in that area. We keep trying to go over there and establish democracies. The only democracy that's over there that actually works is Israel, God's people. When you get down here, he's talking about the removal of a king. So we'll just read verse 21. And afterward, they desired a king, and God gave unto them Saul, the son of Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of 40 years, bang, it's over with. Isn't it interesting in the word and? You just covered 40 years of time in one word. Boy, the great expanses of time. You need to watch them in the Bible. But look in verse number 22. And when he had removed him, and it, boy, he did. Now, he's going to remove him. Why? He's been disobedient to God. Didn't do what God told him to do. The Bible said that a king must be just and must rule in the fear of God. Two things God said in the Old Testament, and He wasn't either one of them. 
Look in verse number 22. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king. Boy, one of the greatest men in the Bible. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to take a phrase out of here. And we're going to kind of follow David along through the Bible because he ties him with a phrase. But he raised up one of the greatest men who ever lived on the face of this earth by the name of David. A king from which the king came. A throne was established upon which the king will rule and reign for a thousand years from the throne of his father David. That's what the Bible says. And he's going to rule in righteousness in what's called the millennial reign of Christ. But notice what he said. He raised up unto them. They wanted a king. He gave them Saul. They didn't want Saul anymore, and neither did God. So God raised up a man to take his place. Now notice what he said, To whom also he, that's God, gave testimony. Now God is going to testify in this verse of Scripture what took place a couple of thousand years ago. Long time ago. Thousand years ago. I think Solomon, David reigned in Solomon around uh, 1000 BC. So here we are. He's going to do something a thousand years later. God is going to give the testimony of a man that God raised up. Now here's the testimony that he gave. He gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse a man after mine own heart. Now, what I want to do over the next few weeks, I want to look at that phrase, a man after mine own heart. Notice what he said. What makes him a man after my own heart? Which shall fulfill all my will. A man after God's own heart puts God's will above his own will. But the only man in the Bible that that phrase of Scripture is tied to. I, I think of great men in the Bible. I think of Adam. Listen, the only time I hear Adam ever sinned was uh, to take a bite of that fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the only reason he did it was because Eve had taken. He desired his wife, a beautiful type of Christ. He died for his bride. Beautiful type of Christ. Find no other place in the Bible where Adam sinned. Boy, all through eight. Hey, you take Abel, righteous man. You go on down. You take Enoch, righteous man. Walked with God and he was not. For God took him. This man walked with God for 300 years. That's a long time to be in step with the Lord. I don't read where he got out of step with the Lord. You go on to Noah. Noah was a just man and upright in his generations. He was justified. He was saved. He looked forward to the coming of Messiah, but he also married within his generations in chapter 6. Those are not angels that saw the daughters of men. The daughters of men is just a phrase used for the ungodly line of Cain. God separated these two lines. He gave that line of Cain in chapter 4 of Genesis. He gave the line of Noah in chapter number 5 in, or in Genesis. And these things were separated, but you found a mixture began to take place in chapter 6. Noah was a great man. I think of Abraham. Abraham, a friend of God. Boy, how that, how that man loved God and God loved Abraham. I think of Isaac. I think of Jacob. I think of all these great men through the Bible. You can find them all. Samuel. Listen, we're not going to go through that list. You go to the New Testament. You think of the great men of God in that New Testament. John the Baptist. The last of the Old Testament prophets. The forerunner of Christ as he stood and said, Repent. Somebody said, What did he preach? He had a three-point outline. You repent, you repent, and you repent. That's what he taught. Hey, he said you bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. Don't tell me you've asked God to forgive you and you've repented of sin and continuing in that. He said you're going to bring forth the fruits before I give you my baptism, all right? I think, I think of the parents, Joseph, the supposed father of Christ, Oh, what a godly man Joseph was. 
when he found his wife with child, not, not wanting to make her a public example, he put her away privately. He was going to do that according to the Old Testament law. The Old Testament law said that if you found somebody during the betrothal period that was impure, uh, that you could put them away legally and break that betrothal, which was as binding as marriage. You could put that away. Boy, you, hey, look at Peter, James, John. Look at these disciples. I'm talking about good men. Boy, look at Paul. The only man in the Bible that God ever said was a man after mine own heart. What is the heart of God? That's the soul of God. That's the heartbeat of God. That's what God desires. That's all, that's all ever God wanted was after his heart. So we find this man, boy, hey, I like to take a sneak peek into the New Testament, read the end of things. You can study two ways. You can go ahead and turn over to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 16. I want to look at this young man for a few minutes. Boy, we've got several verses to read. I'm going to start in verse number 1 of chapter 16. We're going to read about 13 verses this morning. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul? <laughs> hey, Samuel loved Saul. Samuel loved Saul. He loved that man. He anointed that man for 40 years. He was a prophet unto God, unto Saul. He said, How long are you going to mourn for him, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. He said, he's got some boys and I've got one that I'm going to put in Saul's place. Look at verse 2, and Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hear it, he'll kill me. The Lord said, take, take an heifer with thee and say, I'm come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do. Thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. Notice he's going to name somebody, all right? He's going to name him unto Samuel. Why? You're not going to let him anoint the wrong person. God's going to identify him. Verse 4, And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Comest thou peaceably? Listen, back in those days, they feared the man of God. And he said peaceably, I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked upon Eliab. Now this is what Samuel thought. Who is Eliab? He's that firstborn son, that, that patriarch that is to head up that family. When he saw Eliab, he said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Hey, this, this is the one right here. Hey, no doubt in my mind that this is the man that God would have me to anoint. Now, look what he said in verse 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, nor on the height of his stature. He was a great big guy. Because I have refused him, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Now, you and I this morning cannot look upon the heart. We can see the outpourings of the heart. The Bible said that a good tree will not bring forth evil fruit. An evil tree, not good fruit. You can't bring sweet water and, and, and tainted water out of the same fountain. All right, you can't do that. So we see some things that would indicate to us if somebody is trying to do right or not trying to do right. But we cannot see what's on the inside of them. I tell people, be careful with the outward appearance. And we'll deal with that in just a moment. But be careful when you're gauging people by what you see. Only believe a half of what you see and nothing you hear somebody said. So what he did, 
He said, the Lord looks on the inside. Verse 8, then Jesse, he said, well, I'm going to bring the next best one. So he bring, brought a son by the name of Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither hath the Lord chosen this. Why? God hasn't named him yet. Jesse's bringing them both in birthright. Verse 9, then Jesse made Shammah to pass by. And he said, Samuel, neither hath the Lord chosen this. Verse 10, again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. He just one after the other lined them up. Seven sons. They passed before him and Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen thee. At that moment of time, Jesse should have said, I still have another one. Why? Because he's already told him, I'm going to anoint one of your sons. You brought seven. They're not the ones. That only leaves one and Jesse didn't mention him. You see, Jesse didn't see what God knew. Look at in verse 11. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. Verse 12. And he sent and brought him in. Now, he brings this youngest son. Now, when you think of a young son, I don't want you to think about a teenager here. We're going to see some things about this young man. You know, when you get chapter 17, he stands before Goliath. They said, you're but a youth. He's talking about compared to Goliath. To me, if you're 60, you're young. That's a real relative thing when we, we see people as the older we get. I remember when I thought 60 was the ancient of days. I remember when I saw 40, the ancient of days. I remember back in the mid-60s when I went to Western Kentucky University on college days. Uh, we were still in high school and we were trying to find out what school to go with. So these schools had what they called college days to let a lot of high school students come down, walk the campus, show them around the campus. They always had a big football game uh, going on. And, and I'll never forget, I went down there. Boy, I looked at those cheerleaders. I'm not saying this the wrong way. I thought they was grown women. These were college girls, all right? Hey, I look at them now. My, have they not gotten a whole lot younger <laughs> over the years, all right? It's a relative thing. So when you look at David, I want you to understand something. We're not talking about some 16, 15, 14, 12-year-old. You had to be 20 before you could go to war. Now, we're talking about a grown man. We get a picture of somebody real young... Now, notice what he said. Here's what the description, verse number 12. Now he was ruddy. That means that he had a, a little color to his complexion. I, I'm not ruddy. I get kind of, you know, I, I change colors all the time. I'm, I'm a pale-faced, blue-eyed, Anglo-Saxon male. That's not bragging about anything. It's just who I am. And I, boy, you get me out in the sun, I turn red. I peeled off enough times. Usually when I was a kid, I had to peel about three times, two or three times before I began to tan. And then I would get as brown as a biscuit for the rest of the year. We, used, we played out all the time, a pair of shorts. We played uh, tennis, 100 degrees. It didn't, it didn't fathom. Hey, we played, we swam, we went everywhere, we did everything. Listen, I turn gray when I'm scared. I'll turn grayer when I'm dead. All right. I just keep, I'm, I'm one of them just keep, this, this young man had some color to his cheek. Now, need to understand over there that this is in Israel. These, these are Hebrew children and there's a little bit of a, just like it is with anybody else. With races, you have a little color scheme. You have some that are darker, some that are red or some that are whatever. He was ruddy and, hey, he was, notice what he said. 
with all of a beautiful countenance and goodly look on, he was a handsome, he was a handsome man. Good looking man. Very handsome. Very, you know, when the Bible talks about a man beautiful in countenance, normally that's something they use with the ladies, but what they use that word is that one that is very attractive. Oh, when the young girls saw this man, this man was something to look at, all right? He was a good-looking man. Now, notice, and the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Now, he said, I'm going to identify him. Now, he identifies him. Verse 13, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose and went up to Ramah. Now, what I want to deal with this morning is just simply a change of command. God's rejecting Saul. God's picking his replacement. One of these days, God's going to be done with me here. You need to be praying about a replacement. I'm not ready to go anywhere. I may have another 10 or 15 years. I may not have another 10 or 15 moments, and I may be laying the floor, and you caught dialing 911. Uh, hey, that's life. That's just the way it is. I'm good with that. I've always been good with that. You need to be praying. I'm praying that one day God will give a young family, a young man that loves God, a young family to come in. And I'm talking about one that will preach the Word of God, that will be compassionate to the people and love the people. Somebody that God can use for His glory in this church God already had a man picked out. And he identified him. He selected the king. I thought about what he didn't do. His choice was not according to birthright. This was the last born. This was not the first born, folks. That went against the grain of everything in their society. You remember that firstborn son? I, I remember when Barbara and I uh, got married and we were the first ones to give my daddy a boy. My daddy was old school. He couldn't have any girls until my grandfather died in 1957. My grandfather died in 1957 up to that point. All mom and dad had were boys because he wanted boys to carry on that name. That, that was big back in those days. And then finally they got a girl when granddad died. Bob was the first son. I remember the look on dad's face the first time he held a boy. That meant a lot to them. I'm, I'm not so big on that. I love these little girls. I don't care who comes first. All right. I'm just tickled to death. Jessica's going to have a little girl. Little girl, little girl. Hey, I don't know why we ended up with a lot of little girls. That means you little boys in trouble. But he didn't get him according to birthright. That was the natural thing that, hey, they never suspected him. God didn't choose David because of his outward appearance. All of these boys were big strapling youths. Boy, Jesse raised some men. Big men. That's why he said that they talked about the stature is how large these, these boys are. We find that they, they were big, strong boys. He didn't pick David because of his attractiveness. Listen, God, God doesn't care. God doesn't go according to birthright. He can use anybody that makes themselves available. We're going to find the availability of a man who's after God's own heart. Huh? But he didn't take him according to how he looked. You know, we're big on that. We want a pastor to come in here that dresses right and got all the hair swept right and got everything right. Listen, you may get the ugliest pastor in the world other than me to fill the pulpit. One day when this church picks a pastor... You don't want to pick it because of his countenance. You don't want to pick it because of how articulate he might be in the pulpit. You want to pick a man of God that God sends to you. One thing I can tell you about this pastor is God put me here and God's going to have to move me. You want somebody to come and stay. And not just stay because he's comfortable. 
He didn't call him because of what he looked like. He didn't call him because of his stature. Listen, God, God's looking for mature men. But let me just break this down a little bit. God's looking for some ladies too. A church is no better than the ladies that sit on these pews. We've got a bunch of good girls. I, I tell people, you keep your mouth off of my girls. We've had some women leave here and badmouth our ladies. I tell them, you keep your mouth off my girls. These, these are our ladies. Listen. Hey, God doesn't care how old you are this morning. God's looking for some young boys that want to serve God. God's looking for some young women that want to serve God. They want to live for God. They want to make a difference in this life. They want to be holy. They want to be clean. Listen, God didn't pick because of how they looked. God looked on the inside of that heart. In verse number 10, we see God didn't choose David according to what the world wanted. Listen, we always pick the best. Boy, I'll tell you, I, my mind still goes back to a young preacher years ago, and I've used this illustration, but it's a good one, and it needs to be used in chapel one night. Chapel was the prime time in Bible college. Every night we had a couple of classes, we went to chapel Boy, how God moved in the hearts of these young preachers during chapel. And then we went back for a couple of more classes. But that night, I'll never forget, Dr. Clark said, I know of a church that's looking for a good pastor. Anybody interested? His hands went up all over the place out there. Everybody wanted that church. He said, it's in North Dakota. Every hand went zip. They started reading in their Bibles. and reading. Yeah, They didn't even want to make any eye contact with, with Dr. Clark. They, they, they were not interested except for one old boy. And he stuttered so bad. He had a stuttering problem. He couldn't help that. I mean, he, he, he just he really he fought to get words out. He raised his hand. He was interested. This young man was raised in a millionaire's family. His family was not saved. He got saved outside of his family and went off to Bible college. My understanding was his dad told him, if you'll quit Bible college and come home and get involved in the business, I'll put one million dollars in the bank for you the first day. He said he used to look through the bars of the gate outside of the estate that they lived on. Had one of these gates that closed and watched other kids play, but he couldn't go out and play with them. This young man said no to his father and he went to North Dakota. Did a good work for God in North Dakota. They found out something. He stuttered when he talked. He did not when he preached. Isn't that a blessing? I remember two old people, their last name was Jewel. They used to travel around. They had on the front bumper or the front license plate two jewels. They were in their 80s. They sang, boy, beautiful, godly, older couple, get in that pulpit and sang until one day she had a major stroke. Mrs. Jewel never said another word. She could not call her husband by name. But when they stood in that pulpit and he began to sing, she could sing with him just like she did before. Boy, I, I thought about the blessing. Listen, God, God's just looking for somebody that's available this morning. God didn't choose him because of his age. It doesn't matter if you're young or old. It doesn't matter if you're middle-aged. Doesn't matter if you're a teenager, doesn't matter if you're a preteen. You know, preteens can serve God. I thank the Lord for these young men to take up offerings. I thank the Lord for, hey, get your young people involved. People, you say, well, you don't use men to take up the offering. Men can come down and take it up too. I like to involve kids. Get them in, let them work for God. Wasn't because of his age, he was just available. Dr. Bob Jones Sr., I think it was, said that availability was the greatest ability found in the Bible. I thought about usability, dependability, teachability, all types of abilities in the Bible. But you know, you, you can be all these things, but if you're not available, you're no good. 
God can't use somebody that's not faithful. Now, what I want to do is I want to look this morning at what God's choice. I'm just going to sky it on down. I want to look at the character. Character of this young man. Just for a moment. Oh my, we're not, we're not going to get far. But that's all right. I want to look at the character of this young man. Why did God choose this man? You go to the book of Acts. God knew what he was getting before he ever got it. You say, why? Because the Word of God was already written in, in God's heart. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God the same as in the beginning with God. You go to John, uh, Revelation chapter 19 and he come back, he's got a name written on his uh, vest. Hey, on the Word of God, friend. Hey, he already knew what he was going to be. So what he did, he picked a man with character. I read a sign one time and said, you either have character or you are one. Do you have character this morning? Let me define character. The peculiar qualities impressed by the nature or habit of a person. These distinguish him from others. These constitute real character and real qualities which he's supposed to possess constitute his estimated character or his reputation. Now, what is character? Character is what we are on the inside. What was it? Look at verse number 11. The Bible said he keepeth the sheep. If you look back down in verse number 19, he said, which is with the sheep? While everybody else was at the feast, he was doing his job. I don't find where he complains. You know, he could have gone up to his dad and said, Dad, why didn't you invite me? You didn't invite me, Dad. Why, why didn't you invite me? He was content to remain where he was and do what he had been told to do. Interesting, isn't it? He was trustworthy. I don't think you'll ever be used to God until you're content to do small things. You know, one thing about preachers, preachers want to get elevated quick. My pastor told me years ago, Dr. Harold B. Seitler, he said, you go someplace and stay someplace. Dr. Seitler didn't like a lot of movability in preachers. Bouncing around, you know, a lot of them. I, somebody told me when I came to Temple years ago, said, that's just going to be a stepping stone for you. I've stood on that stepping stone for over 34 years, folks. This is not a stepping stone. This is my church. These are my people. I'm content. No, we don't run a thousand on Sunday mornings. We run 75,000 a week. Having a hard time catching them. Well, we're, hey, I'm not into all of this. Thank God for numbers. I want numbers. I want people saved. I want to see people come at it. Hey, you find seasons in Lawrence County. Lawrence County's always been tough. It was tough with Dr. Waters over there, friend. When Dr. Waters left the pulpit. He had less than 75 people at faith. Been there since, what, 1950, somewhere along in there? Let me tell you something. Lawrence County has always... Oh, you say, they've run hundreds at it. Yeah, let me ask you a question. Where are they? I've seen a whole lot of people that used to be's and used to be's and they're out of church or sitting at home. They blame everybody in the world for where they're at this morning. They're there because they were not responsible to what God gave them. God gave them a good man. John Waters wasn't a perfect man. You don't have one either. Let me tell you something. He was a good man. He filled that pulpit, friend. He stayed where God put him. He paid a price to come out. Back in the 50s, buddy, they paid a price when they walked out of the Southern Baptist Convention. They paid a price for it, friend. Contempt. 
He did what he was supposed to do. Second thing, he became a controlled man. In verse number 13, the Bible said the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Jesus just needed somebody. You say, well, where's Jesus? That's who this is, Jehovah God. That's Jesus Christ of the Old Testament. Jesus Christ of the New Testament was, hey, they were one and the same, folks. He wanted somebody that would let God take the reins of his life. Lord, not my will, but thine be done. You say, well, boy, you had a lot of imperfections. We'll deal with them later. God's looking for somebody that's going to be controlled by God. Then in verse number 16, we find he's a very committed man. He said he's a cunning player on a harp. Anybody here play a harp? You know how many strings are on a harp? You used to have a young lady up tabernacle. She'd take that harp and lay it back on that shoulder. A pretty young lady had real long hair. and She just sat up there as pretty as a picture. And boy, when she started doing this. I mean, working across that. I mean, I, guitar's got what? Six or twelve max. What's a banjo for? Five? Yeah, it's got a little short string there. As for people that don't have long arms, you know, they can play down here on the neck a little bit farther, pluck on that thing. Hey, you, hey, you, look, at, you look at the dobro. You look at all these instruments. They, they don't have a lot of strength. It takes a long time to master. Thank God, Miss Betty, you've got 88 strings over here to play with, girl. 88 strings. I can't grip I can't miss with the six, all right? Twelve, I don't know what to do with them. I know you cover them both at the same time, but you slide your finger a little bit. You know, it's got to make different sounds. Everything's different on them. He was a man that was committed to what he was doing. He's called the sweet psalmist of Israel. As a man, he sat on that hillside, friend, and wrote, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not. Do you know how many of the Psalms that David wrote? He wrote over half of them. He was a committed man. We find verse 18, the Bible says, He was a mighty, valiant man, the man of war. Oh, my. Look on down, verse number 18. He's not only a cunning in his playing friend, he's a mighty, valiant man, the man of war. This guy right here, son, was a force to be reckoned with. When he comes in chapter 17 and you got a nine and a half foot man scared everybody to death, he said, I'll have his head. You want to know how big he was? Saul was head and shoulders above every man in Israel. I put him seven feet tall or more. Giant of a man. He offered his armor to David because he thought he could wear it. And when David put it on, he didn't say it's too big. He said, I haven't proved it yet. A friend, he had proved a handful of stones and a sling, son. Many a time, he was a man of war. Boy, he was a, he is a force to be reckoned with. God, God wants some people that are willing to fight. We're not pacifist. Sometimes I open my mouth too much because I've been a fighter all of my life. Hey, I... Hey, we need some people that, friend, hey, I may look meek and easy to get along with, but you get in my face out of that Bible, friend, you have got something to contend with at that point. I have got no backup in me, any shape, form, or fashion. God, God wants some people that will fight for what's right. I stand for what's right. Listen, if you're right and you're biblically right, don't you move that you may be able to withstand in the evil day to take a punch and having done all, they've just beaten you to death, you just stand there. David was a confident man. Look in verse number 18. The Lord was with him. A man after God's own heart is a man of confidence. 
You know why? Because God called him. God put you on these pews. You ought to sit there with confidence. Not everything going to go to suit everybody all the time, folks. That doesn't work. It doesn't suit me. I love it. Brother Harold every day said, everything going your way, preacher. How many times he asked me that? I always say, no, sir. You know why? It doesn't have to go my way. It doesn't have to go my way. Now, I'm always right. But it don't have to go my way. Amen. A man after God's own heart. God took one that everybody rejected. But God looked on the heart of this young man as he sat out there that day with his sheep and everybody's prayed and by and God's just sitting there. And I can see God now just saying, let them pray. When the parade's over with... I'm going to introduce you to the one that you completely look over the top of his head, son. And old Samuel pulled out that horn of oil and poured it on his head in front of them all. And God raised up to himself a man after God's own heart who would perform all of his will. Boy, I may tell you what, you go to Israel today and ask them who's the most important man who ever walked on the face of that ground over there, and they won't tell you Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. They'll tell you it's the one that you see his star on that flag. The star of David, a king that brought forth the king. Amen. Let's stand this morning. We're going to have an invitation. If you need to come, you come. All musicians come today. If you need to come, you come. I thank God for a man by the name of David. I'm looking forward to meeting that guy. <laughs> he was a jewel. A jewel of a 